<laughs> uh, that was a great talk by Tool. And it's, uh, you guys have been lucky. This is a really great, I mean, yeah, excepting myself, a really great series of talks that you're getting today. Um, and I'm glad he woke you up, because I'm going to teach you a lot of math um, right now. And so actually, what I'm supposed to be doing is trying to convince you to use this, uh, this tool that we developed called Gene Mania, which I think is fantastic. And most of the uh, Gene Mania team is here. And our systems guy is on jury duty, so the, uh, it actually went down last uh, about an hour ago. So <laughs> if you're going to use, uh, if you want to try it out during the talk, use beta.gma.org. That's a different, it's a different server, and it's um, it's it's the same, it's the same service. Okay, and what this is is this is a, uh, what I think of as a gene recommender system. So the idea is, you, everybody knows what a gene, uh, recommender system is, right? You go to Netflix, you watch a few movies, and then Netflix figures out what you want to see. Uh, you go to Amazon, you buy a few books, Amazon figures out the type of books that you might want. And so this is what this is, is you put in some genes and it gives you more genes like those. And how does it figure out how to find those genes that are like those? Basically it uses networks of uh, functional interactions among genes. And we uh, essentially collect anything that we can that we think will be uh, at, at, at the minimum useful for predicting gene function. We have kind of a fancy algorithm that, that we use to put everything together. And then we have a fancy algorithm once we have some sort of composite of networks to find the most interacting genes. And that fancy algorithm is what I'm going to talk to you a little bit about today. Um, but what I'm hoping is, or what, what, what I think this algorithm reveals is something very interesting about biological networks in general and trying to predict uh, properties of nodes in those networks, either biological or social or any type of real network that you can find. Okay, so the first part of my talk is going to be about predicting function of biological networks in these gene recommender systems and this, al this fancy algorithm called label propagation, which some of you might have already heard about. And then the other one is this is a new and powerful network-based prediction algorithms that exploit some small world structure of networks. So um, label propagation is pretty much the best, I would say the best algorithm there is if you have a network and you have node labels and you're trying to find more nodes like those. And this just does a little bit better than that, but reveals some, um, some interesting aspects of that first algorithm. Okay. So this is Gmania. This is our interface. It doesn't look that complicated when you come to it. It's just one sentence. It's that you say, find genes in, let's say, human related to one of your genes. And I, you know, I've pulled it up here. Maybe I, I'll take you through it. Because I always tell people to use this thing, and no one ever uses it because I don't show it to them. I looked up CD44, of course, while I was listening to a tools talk. And you basically, I just put CD44 uh, in, and then it's lag in. And it just pulled up a whole bunch of other things that are um, interacting with it. I don't know if these are interesting. But apparently, this is involved in collagen binding and platelet Africa. You know, you know, it's not clear if that's going to work beautifully, but what I'm not showing you is here we could find out about the networks. You get information about the networks that are connecting these things together. You can look in on at specific links and find out how those two things are linked together, right? And then just follow through to find out more information about that network. Okay. It, it's something you can do just during a talk and it, I think, works very nicely in case you get bored. Okay. All right, so what's the principle by which we're finding these other networks? And this is basically a guilt by association principle. And so this is a very basic principle and it's been around for years. But the idea is, is that if you have some way of measuring functional similarity between a pair of genes, and in this case, let's just say it's that they're co-expressed under the same set, same set of conditions, then you can use that to build a network where the weights on the edges tell you something about your, um, the evidence for shared function, then if you, in that network, you have some nodes that you know what the function is, or you have some idea about what they are, and you have some other nodes that you don't know very much about, those ones that are highly linked to nodes of known function, you can make an inference about what, the, uh, what you might think those nodes, uh, those genes do. Okay, it's a very simple principle, and it works for all sorts of types of network evidence, and you can collect Lots of different types of evidence about genes. So a tool talked about how big a geo is. So you can get hundreds and hundreds of networks out of geo just by calculating co-expression networks, just putting them on top of each other and counting the number of co-expression links. You can also look at genetic interactions. You can look at co-complex data. And you know, it, it literally for decades, uh, my esteemed colleagues, uh, both in the computational biology community and, and in the um, machine learning community, have been trying to combine these networks together 
in order to, uh, to say something um, more about gene function. And you'll, the, basically the idea comes down to this, is you take each network, you multiply it by a weight, and then you add them all together according to those weights and you get this network back. And these, these, these algorithms have fancy names, so that's basically what it is. All right. So that part of it's actually pretty straightforward. And so, so now once you have this kind of composite network that combines together all these different sources of data, well, what do you do with it? Well, there's two basic questions that you can ask. You can say, what does my gene do? And here is the goal is to, is to get some insight into the gene's function by find out, finding out what uh, genes it interacts with. The other idea is to give me more genes like these. So you have a list of genes, say genes involved in wind signaling. You want to find more of those. You want to find more kinases. You want to find more members of the protein complex by querying all the, everything that everybody else has ever done in the field. All right? And so to answer the question, what my gene does, basically your input is all this data plus your query list. In this case, this is just one gene name. And you just find highly interacting genes. And one trick uh, that I learned from Olga Trolinskaya, but maybe uh, other people invented, is just that you, you look for uh, things that are functionally enriched among the, uh, the highly interacting genes of that. So this is, um, I don't know, I read this paper. Uh, you know, they made a co-expression network. It came out about a year ago. Uh, that gene was GRN, which I think also David mentioned. Just put it in the gene menu, run it, uh, and you get lysosome, which is um, the localization of this gene. It's actually pretty straightforward to get that type of thing. The other thing, the other question is give me more genes like this. So it's the same idea. You put the query list in, you put in the gene recommender system, you pull up the genes which are given the, as the dashes and all their neighbors. And then the, these neighbors here, these are genes that highly interact with this list here, right? So it's just a, it's a nice interface and a nice way of just using all the data that's available to answer one of two very simple questions. And we're not the only people who have uh, discovered this type of idea. And so the you know, string is, is, uh, is another gene recommender system that has been around for a long time. Also, there's BioPixie. There's a couple reasons why I think you should use um, uh, gene mania. One is that, is that the way we have the algorithm set up is we do on-the-fly computation of these networks. So what that means is, is you can turn networks on and off. You can decide if I'm, you wanna, only want to consider protein interaction data or co-expression data, or you want to upload your own data, that's very easy to do with the interface. The other is this, the label propagation algorithm. And this is sort of the, the key algorithm for trying to predict, in a, once someone gives you a network and gives you a, a set of positive examples, what other genes should be positive examples or what other nodes should be positive examples. And that's what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk on. I mean, we've also added gene attributes as well as networks, and we have a pretty large set of network data, but that's, that's not... And so all I'm going to say about network weighting is what we do is not very different from anybody else. But essentially, you know, it doesn't matter actually how you weight each of the networks so long as you don't give positive weights to networks that are essentially noise. And there's a variety of ways of doing that. And if you use any of those techniques, it works about the same. Okay. So why should you use label propagation? Okay. So has anyone heard of label propagation before? Besides Gary. Okay. All right, so label propagation will actually make you rich and famous. So has anybody recognized these people? They're the ones who invented the algorithm, right? And then when Google changed the world in 1998, it was because of this, this page rank algorithm. And label propagation is actually a modified version of something called personalized page rank. Okay, and so also it works better than anything else. So if you have a network and you have a set of positive examples, I've never really found an algorithm that works better than just straight label propagation. And the nice thing about this, compared to all the other sort of machine learning algorithms, is it has no parameters. Or, I mean, it has a secret one parameter that not a lot of people know about. But if you just set that parameter to this default value, it works incredibly well, right? Not only does it work well, it's actually faster than anything else I know about, except for just like counting the number of neighbors that are positive examples. And label propagation works a little bit better than that. It's, but it's a little bit, and it's a little bit slower than that. But there's reasons that you want to use label propagation and not just count the number of neighbors. And I'm going to tell you about those in this talk. Okay, and so this is just one example. This is air, so lower is better. We did label propagation on one network. We did uh, support vector machine on that same network. And we looked over like a thousand gene ontology categories. And we just used this because these are ways of labeling nodes. And there's a lot of different labels so you can get some good statistics. And we did better. 
and this is out of the box. And this, you know, consistently you see this type of thing. Okay, and so there's actually a ton of different types of label propagation algorithms, and they all come down to uh, small variations on something I'm just going to tell you about right now. And this is called random walk with restart. And this is, where, this is sort of where PageRank came from. And so here's the idea. So you have this network here, right? You can all see the lines and the nodes. And the, and the, the nodes that are big are these, these are so-called positive examples, right? And the goal here is to score every one of these other nodes in the network according to, like, how close they are to the positive examples or how likely they are to share function with the positive examples. And here, because we all know about modules, I think the right labeling is to make all of these ones big and all these ones small, right? And this is a little distractor node, sometimes called a date hub, which unfortunately, it, from the point of view of trying to predict function of genes, it connects to a whole bunch of different processes that it's multifunctional, and it, it's going to start to confuse us a little bit. Okay, so how's random walk with restart work? So you randomly choose one of these nodes, boom, right? And then you randomly choose one of its neighbors to go to, just with equal probability, right? Now at this point you make a choice. Do you keep going or do you restart? If you restart, you're going to randomly choose one of these nodes. If you keep going, you randomly choose one of the neighbors of these nodes. You can go back here if you want. Okay, so this time around we restarted. So we start the walk there. Now we've chosen a neighbor and boom. Okay, and I think, yes. And so if you keep doing this over and over and over and over again, you get the final node scores. Now you don't actually have to carry out the simulation. You can compute it analytically. So it's actually quite fast to compute these numbers. But what I hope you can see is what happens in this process is that if you go outside of this cluster, you might get in here and bounce around a little bit. But if you stay inside the cluster, when you're doing the random walks, if you start here, it's very hard to get out because there's only kind of one way to get out, right? So these, these nodes, they reinforce each other in their scores. And if you write down the final node scores in this example, all these ones are big and these ones are a little bit small. And of course, these ones are a little bit bigger because you can get to from here. But there's no reinforcement there, right? So it, it's, it's a nice way of trying to detect these kind of modules. And I'll explain um, in a few slides why it, it works as well. So the label version of label propagation that we use is very much like the random walk with restart with uh, two small variations. The first thing is when we're choosing to restart, we restart less often with nodes that have a lot of neighbors, right? Uh, that's because these, these nodes tend to have less specific functional information. They tend to have more functions that are, tend to be more multifunctional. So uh, they're less reliable in the information that they provide. And then at the end, because these nodes also often have a lot of functions, we scale up their score a little bit according to the number of neighbors that it has. Now, we didn't do this on purpose. We just used a different flavor of label propagation that, that did this uh, simply, by, um, simply by the nature of how the algorithm works and before we found this connection to random, start, uh, random walk with restart. But it, tended, it, it turned out that it, it worked the right way. Okay, so I've given you a little information about label propagation. I'm just going to finish off talking to you about Gene Mania. And as long as you promise that you're at least going to go to the website and try it out a couple times, uh, I'm not going to belabor this point. So uh, we get data from all over the place. So if you open up the advanced options panel, uh, we get co-expression networks. We get to download genetic interactions, physical interactions. We, uh, we predict in Terra logs, and we get other uh, predicted networks from the literature when we're able to curate them. We build networks of shared protein domains. We also have a whole bunch of other data sources that are or organism specific, like yeast protein localization. Sometimes we steal other people's networks and put them in, but they're publicly available. Why should we use them? Uh, we get our gene ID mappings from Ensemble. Uh, we get uh, also gene to network descriptors from these people, and we get gene annotations from uh, gene ontology. Essentially, we put it all together in a nice package that you can get through, through the website, but we also make all our data available for download. Um, through this, through Cytoscape, so we have a Cytoscape plugin, also through this data download page, right? So we're packaging all this stuff up for you, and we're doing it, trying to do it in an automated fashion. So we do it, uh, so we redo the data about every three to six months. Okay, so and then we have, we consider not only networks, but now we start uh, looking at gene attributes. So we try to predict genes that are similar to your to your seed list based on. Uh, them sharing specific protein domains, and then we tell you what those shared domains are. Um, the network display component of Gmania is actually uh, available separately. Uh, 
through, it was originally called Cytoscape Web, and now it's, uh, there's been an advance, and it's, been, it's called uh, Cytoscape.js now, and it's HTML5 compatible, and this is a project that's being done by Max, who's here, and Christian, who's here, and UA is here, but I, I just saw him in the audience, but I don't have a picture of him. Sorry about that. But you, you should be able to find him. And that's, uh, that's just about to come out. We have a Cytoscape version of this. It was developed by Jason, who's here, but his hair is slightly longer now. He's right over there. You can see how long his hair if you want. And you can download, download that from the Gene Mania plugin. Also, it's available just through the, um, this normal Cytoscape way of getting plugins. Uh, I shouldn't probably, yeah, never mind. I'm not going to tell anyone here that I don't use Cytoscape that often because it's going to get me into trouble. Okay, all right. So uh, this is Cytoscape, um, and this is our Cytoscape plugin. And there we go. It has all the functionality of the website. You can download the data. The nice thing about it is, is we actually have command line versions so that you can make your own version of Gene Mania. Uh, so you can make it for your own organisms. Right now we only support seven of them. And you can actually make any, t and you can use our suite of algorithms for any type of network data that you have, actually. And your command line tools allow you to put that together and then interact with it in, in a Cytoscape um, framework. And all the various command line tools that have been developed are described in this page here and this page there. So these are the people who were involved in the original Gene Mania project. I'm, I've left out about five co-op students who are, are also uh, participated considerably, and these were our funding sources. Right, so a number of people have left the lab, so the current team actually looks like this. Uh, as I said, Max and Christian and Jason are here. Harold is the one who's on jury duty. Uh, and we're hoping Khaled is, is, is gonna put the website back up soon. And we're currently funded by Ontario and by the NRNB. Okay, any questions about Gene Manion before I go on to the slightly better algorithm for predicting functions in networks? Yeah. So you, well, so you saw yeast, not human. And, and so we'd select 20 by default. And that's, that's for historical reasons. In the old day, so, so, we, get, so we, we acquired two things of uh, co-expression networks. First of all, because most of our stuff is automated, we, uh, we want to make sure that we're not pulling down, like Geo contains all sorts of microarray data, but contains all sorts of weird formats and stuff like that. So we want to make sure that we're pulling down data that corresponds to genes. So uh, we, uh, you know, in order for us to pull data out of Geo, it's gotta, it's gotta be in one of the formats that we recognize. And because we're using co-expression rather than you know, whether or not there's, uh, it's in disease versus normal, it, it has to be sort of large enough that we, we think that we're gonna be able to get a, um, a good co-expression signal. Like, unlike a tool, we don't, do any, um, we don't do any literature mining or anything like that. We don't actually try to even figure out what it is that each of the samples corresponds to. We just use them to calculate a core expression. And you can imagine that's going to give you a lot of noisy data, right? And that's certainly something that we noticed early on. And so what we, what we put in historically is we only use 20 core expression data sets because in, in, you know, we found that the signals you know, didn't get better after 20 and it slows things down a little bit. But we recently discovered a, a trick that allows us to fix this problem. And that's we don't believe any core expression link that we see unless we see it twice. And it turns out if you do that, that, that reduces the amount of co-expression links you have by 75%, and it makes co-expression data a whole lot more valuable. But you know, because these things move a bit slowly, and I, I, I don't like change, um, we, haven't, we haven't changed this thing about using only the 20 networks. So in human, we use 200 networks, and we could probably pull in more if, if we wanted to. Um, and it's just for historical reasons we haven't so far. size. They're the biggest ones. Yeah. What kind of size are you looking for in order to um, it, the minimum size the uh, the minimum size for which would give us two hundred networks. I can't remember what that is. It's probably around fifty. It it varies by organism because we were like as like I was saying in the in the, in the beginning we were controlling the number of co expression links we had because if you have too many interactions, it slows down our interface. But now we've, we've thrown away, you know, 
fork 75% uh, of their data so we don't have to, we don't have a speed issue anymore. So we're, we can probably expand this out a little bit. But less than 12, we don't believe the co-expression signal, less than 12 samples. Okay, yeah, one more question. So I, mean, I, I can tell you how we did the comparison in, in this particular case. We're using SVMs just as, uh, like, SVMs take similarity measures, and we're using the network as a similarity measure. And so we're just using the SVM directly. But the, the fact is, is that there are 20 different ways to implement the SVM, and then there's, like, five, you know, there, there can be, like, three or four different parameters that you have to set with the SVM. Okay, well, I mean, I, I was the one who did it, and I'm pretty good at this stuff. So, <laughs> and, and it's, it's, it's compared to work that I had previously published. So I actually tried really hard to make it work the first time around with the SVMs, and then we discovered label propagation, and then I just used it against the old result. Yeah. So, um, yes, you know, maybe there's like some setting of like the, the three different SVM parameters and the four different kernels and like the three different ways you can transform the data that might make it better than label propagation under some circumstances. Right, or but you can do this out of the box. Okay. So now I'm gonna tell you how you can do better than label propagation and a little bit better under some circumstances and a lot better under other circumstances. And this is something that we've, um, uh, there, uh, that's recently coming out, and you know, it's actually really hard to talk about this work anywhere because no one loves networks as much as I hope this crowd does. And you kind of have to love networks to love this stuff. Like me, I love networks. Okay, so the question is, why does label propagation often work so well, right? And then, and so that I think there's two properties of of biological networks and a lot of other networks that that make it work well when just like looking at your neighbors and seeing what their labels are doesn't work well. One is this, this kind of idea of, of date hubs. And you know, whether or not you believe this specific paper, uh, a lot of people like this paper a lot. There's some nodes in networks that are hubs that are like social butterflies. They connect to, get to uh, a lot of different processes together and they, they inherit the, the annotation or the function of everything that it, they connect to. And because they're so highly connected, if you're this poor guy here, you don't know if you're a blue node or a red node because one of your neighbors is red, right? And if you're just looking at your neighbors, you're not knowing about the fact that this red guy is just connecting to everybody. So you should pay a lot less attention to him. Okay. So the other thing is, is that, you know, these nodes that are all have the same label, people who, you know, genes that are all, all of the same function, they tend to uh, occur together in these modules, like these kind of partial cliques. Right, where there's a lot of connectivity within the module and not much connectivity between the module. Right, and so if you go back into the, so the way this label propagation algorithm works, I'm just reminding you what the answer looks like when we ran the propagation on this network. You can actually roll out the, propaga uh, the label propagation. It gives you some insight into how the whole thing is working, right? Okay, so this is a very complicated slide, but it's important, so you're gonna have to concentrate. And I'm gonna take you to it, through it pretty slowly. Okay, so remember this is the original network with these positive nodes indicated, right? And remember I told you to use the random walk with restart, so you select one of these, you randomly choose a neighbor, and then maybe go back to, the, uh, to one of these nodes, or you take another step. You can actually roll out this process in terms of random walks of different lengths, right? And in fact, this network is exactly equal to an infinite sum over, random, over the length of random walks. And don't let that scare you where the first part of the sum is just this network, which is the probability that a one-step random walk 
starts from a positive node and ends in your node, right? And there I'm just showing these probabilities as like the size of the node here, right? Right, and then you multiply that by the probability that your random walk is only of length one and that's the restart probability P, right? Then you add in this network which shows the probability that a two-step random walk ends in a positive node or starts in a positive node and ends in you. Right? And then you multiply the probability, multiply that by the probability of taking a two-step random walk, which is P, the restart probability, times one minus P because you took an extra step. And so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. Right? But because P is less than one, these things keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller over time. And these probabilities are bounded, uh, uh, they're bounded by one. You can't have a probability more than one, right? So the contributions of the ones that are way over here, they get smaller and smaller. So really, I mean, let's just talk about these first three steps. Okay. So now if you look at this first step, things are a little bit messy here, right? Because this, uh, this guy has screwed everything up by connecting to get a, a whole bunch of different processes together. And in this, time, in this case, we were a little bit lucky that we had three in here and everybody was kind of connected well to one another that this was fairly descriptive. But now let's see what's happened is this has cleaned things up a little bit. So these guys are sort of more stabilized and there's a more consistent difference between the sizes of these nodes and the size of these other, of these other nodes because these, it's actually these two-step random walks that tell you that, that you're in the same module. Because if you're in a module and you take one step and then another step, it's hard to get out if everybody's connected to one another, even if they're not directly connected to one another. So this is where the sharing kind of occurs, is at the two step. And then you go to three steps, and then you know things, they, they, they blend out a little bit more, though you still get this kind of sharing. And so actually, if you keep going along this, can everybody tell me what, what's going to happen if I keep taking longer and longer random walks, what this graph is eventually going to look like? Yeah, they're, they're pretty much going to be the same size. It depends how I do the random walks, but you know, basically, um, depending uh, on how I do the random walks, either they're going to be the same size. If they yeah, exactly, sorry, uh, they're all going to be the same size. That's right. Yeah, because basically, you know, over time, you sort of lose track of where you started from, right? And that'll happen eventually. So at some point, the additional terms don't matter. Okay, so it's the second step probability that makes it work well. This first step probability is basically just looking at your neighbors and deciding how many of them are in the positive set. Okay, but sometimes it actually fails horribly. And this is a nicely constructed example where label propagation is, it works really badly. It's a nicely constructed one, but it's a real example. And so this is a sub-network of what's called a geneg negative genetic interaction network from a, a recently published paper from uh, Charlie Bloom and Brenda Andrews lab. And this, this, these types of interactions, they often, um, nodes that have the same label aren't directly connected to an, uh, each other, but they share a lot of neighbors, right? And this is a particularly bad case of that, where all the nodes on the outside have the same label, and all the nodes on the inside don't have the same label, and that label is transcriptional initiation. So if you just take four of the positive nodes from here, and then you do the little, you do the label propagation thing, you can see here's the first step, and I used a, a 0.5 restart probability, so here's what happens after the first step. Of course, these guys aren't connected to one another, so you all go in there. And this is what happens after the second step, and this is what happens after the third step. And then this is what the label propagation solution to this is. And that is horrible. It's actually much worse than random. And that's basically because you don't actually, the first step doesn't take you to a node with the same label. Right? You've got to go two steps out before you can get that. And so it does actually the reverse of what you would hope it would do. And even worse is actually, I mean, you can adjust the restart probability to change these weights, but this weight's always going to be bigger than this weight, which is always going to be bigger than this weight. And actually what you'd like to do is this is actually a pretty good way of labeling the nodes, except the nodes that you want to be big are small and the nodes you want to be small are big. So you'd rather give this kind of a negative weight. Right? So what if you could label, if you could weight each one of these things independently? And if you could, you could provide these with negative weights, and then this would be the answer that you come up with. Now obviously I've rescaled things and changed the sign and stuff like that, but ultimately all I've done is I've weighted each one of these things separately, and I've actually inferred what these weights are supposed to be by taking two of the positive nodes and holding them out and seeing what weights would best, so pretending I didn't know that these were positive nodes, and then seeing what weights would 
uh, would great um, would co give the most distinction between the positive and the negative nodes. And this is a this is an algorithm that we we've called three prop. Right. So all we do is we assign separate weights to each of the first three random steps, and um, we we set those weights by cross validation using like a linear discriminant analysis. Okay. So obviously I've constructed this example where three prop really wins the game. Right, so what happens in these, these situations in which uh, like label propagation does do well? So this is one of these situations where you would expect label prop propagation to do well. You have two clusters here, um, and the correct labeling is to have all these guys uh, labeled positive. And you, you, you get the bouncing around within these clusters, but you have these like annoying nodes that are going between processes. Right, so you take the first step probabilities, and you get these ones coming up, but the second step kind of cleans this thing up so these things are all consistent and then these things are all uh, consistently low. And the third step looks a lot like the second step. And then when you add everything up together, you get the nodes that are looking like this. Though there's a couple of these nodes that might be slightly bigger than ones over here. So it's not perfect. Right? If you do it with three prop, you get to choose the way you, you weight things, and these are set automatically, and you get a perfect distinction between these, these two sets of nodes. Okay. So, I mean, that's just the basic idea. And uh, the rest of the time, I'm just going to tell you why it does well and, and what it is about the properties of biological networks that allow you, first of all, to just look at the first three sets and also why sometimes you want to weight things positively and sometimes you want to weight things negatively. Right? But the nice thing about this is, is that it, it's just adapted to both situations. It's adapted to the situation where uh, label propagation does well. And it's adapted to this other situation where label propagation is not going to work at all. Okay, so just to see how well it works in general, we, we looked at uh, some network prediction tasks. And basically, what we tried to find were, were large networks that were available. And so we took social networks. So this, these are networks of friends from Facebook in the old days before, uh, when Facebook was school specific. There's five networks out there. And then the labeling task is to try to predict gender. We also looked at uh, the, uh, the negative genetic interaction network I was showing you earlier and the protein interaction network, which I think we just got from BioGrid. And here we are just trying to predict uh, 47 different protein functions, each of those as a binary prediction task. We looked at the, uh, the citations of political blogs as a network and tried to predict whether a blog, a blog was liberal or conservative based on what it, it pointed to. And we also looked at the patent citation, citation network, which is actually a massive network that's got you know, 3 million nodes and 30 million edges. And we were trying, to, uh, uh, trying 381 binary patent category prediction tasks. Right. And so the idea is to use the same algorithm on all this, compare it against label propagation, which is the best algorithm we know about so far for predicting things in networks, and see how well it did. Well, let me explain what else is in the table here. So the diameter of the network is basically the longest path between any two nodes in the network. Okay, so you know, there's 23, the, the longest path between any two nodes in the patent network is 23 long. And this, this here, this is average shortest distance. So this is the average length of the shortest path between any two nodes, okay? And uh, I want you to remember this. And you maybe you, you can get a little bit of a hint where the talk's going. You can see that these average shortest distance, they're almost all less than three. Now we didn't choose that. <laughs> that just happened when we, when we chose the networks. We didn't select that. Okay, so when we ran this, we, we, uh, we did cross-validation to, to predict the weights. We also use cross-validation to predict what the right restart probability was for, was for uh, label propagation. And this is the average precision that we got for recovering all the categories. The gray one is label propagation. And the blue bar is, is three prop. You know, in most cases, we do a little bit better. If you look at you know, percentage improvement, we do a lot better on this genetic interaction network, which is not appropriate for label propagation. But a lot of these other networks are actually quite appropriate for label propagation, and still we got you know, some or some marginal improvement. But what we did especially well on is we, especially well at Facebook predicting gender. So here, what, what I've shown here is this is the area in the ROC curve. This is one way of measuring performance and average precision is just another way of measuring performance that, um, you know, these, in this case, they're fairly similar what they come up with. And these lines here, this is as well as you can do with label propagation, just varying that precision parameter throughout its entire range. Right, and then this is with two prop, so that's where you just take, we just assign weights to the first two uh, networks, and this is with three prop, and so this is the performance we got on all the five networks. Right, you can see it's a huge improvement uh, just by adding that extra third step. 
Now the weird thing about adding that extra third step is if you look at the weights, the first thing is, is that the weights for each of the networks is basically the same. I mean, the task is predicting gender, but these are, these are totally different social networks, right, from different universities. But there's something consistent about these social networks so that the weights are always like, this is near zero, this is somewhere about 0.45, and this is minus 0.5 here, right? And these negative weights actually end up being pretty important. And I'm not going to show you, but I'm going to tell you that when we did the same thing in the protein interaction networks and the genetic interaction networks, we got weights that looked a lot like this, low around 0.5 and around minus 0.5. Now, these weights are scaled, so they sum to 1, right? So there's something weird and consistent about all these networks that that is revealed by uh, three prop trying to assign weights to each of the steps in order to recover this sort of shared function. Now there's one ex exception for when we didn't get basically the identical weights and that's that's when we went and looked at the patent network. So these are the weights for the patent network where we're putting the weights in the in a 3D uh, picture here and uh, we've colored, each of these points corresponds to one of the patent categories, and so the weights that we got for that patent category. And what Sarah's done here is she's actually colored the points by the, uh, the average year of the patent. So the yellow ones down here, these are the newer patents, and these are things like computer memory, cryptography, and the stuff out here is like sewing and cutlery and stuff like that. Right? And you can see that the, I mean, we would expect these weights to lie in a two-dimensional manifold because there's actually only two degrees of freedom in the weights, but they actually seem to lie in a one-dimensional manifold. There's this line here that they're tracing through this three-dimensional space. And along this line, what we see is that these are the older patents, and eventually it's coming to the newer patents down here in the yellow. And we think what's going on here, this just reflects the age of the, uh, of the patents. So these patents are actually looking at a smaller network that's a subset of these networks, but these patents old uh, here They've been around for a longer time, so a lot more patents could have pointed to them that are further and further away in the network. Okay. When I saw this, I was just, I don't, I, I mean, that's kind of amazing. I don't, yeah, I love this thing. So, so what's going on here? Why is this working? So why are these three steps enough? And, and why is the third step negative? Okay. So why are three steps enough? So. The reason three steps, I think, are enough is that many, many of these networks are so-called small world things. And it's too bad uh, that James didn't go first to talk about some of these uh, concepts. But I'm assuming a lot of you know what a small no world network is, but if you don't, I'll explain it very quickly. I mean, these small world networks, in general, they have high degree hubs, and they contain many short paths connecting most nodes. Many of these paths go through hubs. So if you want to think about a small world network, the way to think about it might be like an airplane flight network. Right? You want to get from point A to point B, you go from point A to a hub, you come down to another, another hub and then come out of point B. Right? And these hubs have tons of flights that are floating out, and like basically every city is near every other city. Right? Now, a network that's not a small world network <laughs> is a road map. How I guess, okay. And so the road map, I mean, if you think of each city as a node in the road map, you've got to go through a whole bunch of cities to get from the west coast to the east coast. And it's not like a lot of this, you know, most cities have about the same number of roads coming out of them. So what happens, what happens when you start walking randomly in, this, uh, in the flight map versus the road map, right? So if you walk r randomly in the road map, if I just start driving and I get to the next city and I choose a road out by random and I start driving and going and forth, so forth and so forth, I'm going to stay in California, right? Maybe I'll end up in Oregon. Maybe I'll end up, what is this over here? That's like, this is Nevada, right? Right, I'm not really going to get that far away, but if I, go to an airplane, if I go to an airport and start taking random planes, I can get really far away very quickly. Right? So if you start randomly walking in a small world network, it's really easy to get lost. And what, what I mean by that is like, forget where you've come from because you've gotten so far away from it, there's no information left in where you are that tells you where you came from in the first place. And so you can actually you can simulate this process in biological networks and it's actually, you know what the equilibrium distribution is, and so when you take these, uh, when you take random steps, you very quickly, especially in this genetic interaction, converge to the equilibrium distribution. Protein networks is actually a lot slower, but ultimately, once you hit this equilibrium distribution, once you hit this like point at which you've gotten lost in the network, 
these extra random steps that are being added by label propagation, they're not giving you any additional information. So you might as well set the weights to zero. Right? So it's only the first three steps that are giving you any information because after that you're, you're so far away from where you started from that it doesn't matter anymore. And like if you actually look at it, and what you do is you do, you, you do label propagation, but you actually cut off the, uh, at some point so you don't look any further in the random steps, you, you find that you can actually do a, a much better job by just truncating at two or three steps and ignoring the rest of the steps if you have a very small restart probability. Right? Okay. So then why is the third, step, uh, third weight negative? So I told you to remember this, and this average shortest distance, I think, is what's coming in here. So it's less than three. So what does that mean? Well, so what that means is, is that once you get three steps away, you're actually further away than average from a node. Right? And so if you're more than three steps away from a positive node, you're probably not likely to be a positive node because, like, you know, most of the other nodes are closer to positive nodes than you are. Right? That would be a really weird process. Right? So, you know, the third step, the third random wa uh, walk probabilities are very similar to second random walk probabilities, but they start bringing in these nodes that are really far away. Right? So it's like kind of like a finite difference. You know, I want, ones, I want nodes that are clustered together with the positive nodes, but I don't want these ones that are really far away from the positive nodes, so I'm going to take the difference of these two things. Right? And so, you know, if you want to apply a method like this maybe to a different network that doesn't have this property, what I would, uh, what I would say to do is to actually look at the average shortest distance and just do one more step beyond there. Okay, so this is a very wordy summary, but I, it's good because I'm just going to read it. Um, so label propagation, it performs well in network prediction tasks because it considers greater than these one-step random walk probabilities. It can take advantage of this kind of clustering that, that you see when you consider longer, longer random walks. But it actually doesn't make best use of that information because it weights it less than the first step. And then most of the time when we let the weights re, uh, choose what they want to be, it's actually the second step that gets the highest weight. Also, there's a lot of networks that it can adapt to, like these negative genetic interaction networks, in which we do much better um, when we use when we allow the weights to be uh, set separately. Uh, so three prop, instead, it assigns the first three steps separate weights, which is very adaptive because the label information available land, random walks disappears, right? So if you were going to adapt the weights in this way, you don't need more than about th uh, than about three steps, depending upon how 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 uh, far away nodes are on average from each other, right? And this, this happens because this, this tendency to get lost when you take these random steps, so like this information disappears. And strangely, this third step weight is almost always negative, and it seems to depend on the average shortest path distance. Okay, just I go, uh, 30 seconds. So, so, I mean, if you just want to use label propagation on the box, it's great. You don't have to worry about parameters. When you use three prop, you actually have to set two parameters which is annoying because you can use label propagation with a single node, right, because there's no parameters to set. But there's, the nice thing is, is it seems like in most cases there are characteristic weights for the networks, right, that, that, uh, that act. For the Facebook networks, there was different networks that all gave the same weights, and for the genetic and physical interaction networks, there were different functions defined on the networks that all gave the same weight. So if you find these characteristic set of weights, you can use them for new functions. Okay, so uh, this work was actually done by uh, Sarah Mustafavi. She's now a postdoc in Stanford, and Adam Goldenberg, who has her own group now in the Hospital of Sick Kids. And uh, in the development of this algorithm, we got a lot of help from Charlie and Gary. Uh, Charlie, in particular, had this insight that you should allow the weights to be negative sometimes, and that turned out to be the most important thing. Okay, thank you very much. We haven't looked at uh, disconnected graphs. This all, all this work is done on connected graphs so far. Um, and certainly if the graph is, uh, so we haven't played with that idea very much. There's a postdoc in my lab who's kind of playing with that idea right now, so I don't have an answer for you. But um, the way I would think is the graph is really small, the weights can vary a lot. Once the graph gets a certain size, it stabilizes. Ha, <laughs> ha,
<laughs> um, I think the way to interpret it is that if there's somebody that you don't share a lot of friends with, but you, uh, your friends share a lot of friends with, they're probably a woman. <laughs> so we'll have to get to that discussion at the, uh, at the break, and I think we'll have some interesting discussions.